والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلاق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وخاتم النبيين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فاسألوا أهل الذكر إن كنتم لا تعلمون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his wisdom, he created for us in this world causes. And he wanted us to take these causes to achieve certain goals. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for us the medicine. The ultimate cure comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, Allah also created for us medicine. So if a person, for example, is suffering from a particular ailment, for which there is a medicine, a pill, for example, a drug. A person not only sits down and says, Ya Allah, cure me. He or she is actually mandated to take this medicine such that they could be cured. At the same time, they also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the cure. It is said one day, Musa alayhi salam, the prophet, he became ill. And so he asked Allah, he said, Ya Allah, cure me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied to him, he said, Ya Musa, I can cure you. But by my wisdom, I have decreed that there are causes for which things have to be taken through. Yes, I am the ultimate creator of all causes. I am the cause of all causes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, musabbibul asbab. He is the one who makes, creates all the causes. But these causes should be taken. So I told him, Ya Musa, by my wisdom, I have decreed that your cure is by taking the medication. Take it and you'll be cured. He said, but Ya Allah, aren't you the Mu'afi? Aren't you the Shafi? Aren't you the one who's curing? In fact, one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ash-Shafi, the one who cures, the one who heals. He said, yes, indeed I am, but I have decreed that by my wisdom, there are causes that I have created for people to follow. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have given us direction. Now, how can we find some causes that we are unaware of? For example, going back to this medication, a person, God forbid, is struck with an ailment and illness. He or she needs to find the cure. If he or she has studied medicine, then he or she can figure out what the cure is through their own ijtihad, through their own work. They've studied, achieved a certain knowledge such that when they open the books of medicine, they can understand them and they can derive what medication is good and bad. That's one way. Alternatively, which is the majority of people, they haven't studied medicine. So in that case, what should they do? They have to go see a person who is an expert in medicine. And he or she will grant them the prescription and write them what's correct. So that's when it comes to the medication. And this is something standard. People usually turn to the experts to learn. In fact, that's what even companies do. There is a professor by the name of Dr. Muhammad Yunus from Bangladesh. He's well known for winning the Nobel Prize for Peace a few years ago for establishing the concept of microcredit. He says in one of his books, he writes, he said, I was invited to France to give a talk because he established a bank, a banking system in Bangladesh, which basically 
established the idea or the concept of microcredit. So he was invited to France to give a talk about this whole thing. He says, when I arrived to France, a big corporation, a big company, they invited me over for a talk, lunch. So they came, they brought me all these luxury car, everything. A very luxurious restaurant. I sat down with the president of the company. It's a French company. And they told me we want to open a branch in that part of the world, your part of the world. So we need to figure out how can we do this. We know you're an expert. He's a professor and he's established a bank. He knows well about the economic system. So we need your help. How can we do it? And he said, we sat down figuring out how to establish a business. But he said, the difference is that that business was to the benefit of the poor people. What he called as a social business. Social business. So that's the concept he introduced in his book. Nonetheless, even major corporations, big companies, those who have, mashallah, hundreds of analysts and experts and accountants and so on and so forth, they still reach out when it's time to expand, when it's time to explore. So it's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. It's a system that Allah created. And people who have aql, a mind, that is the route they follow. They don't just go blindly into the dark. Now, when it comes to the ahkam of Islam, of religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us prophets and messengers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us scriptures and books to guide us to the sarat al-mustaqeem, to guide us to the straight path. For us, the followers of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Indeed, he enlightened the hearts, he enlightened the minds, he opened the paths and illuminated them. He managed to convert that society of jahiliya, ignorance, into a society of golden years. Even now, they're now coming up with terms that we should not be calling the dark ages the dark ages. We should be calling them the golden ages ages because they were dark for some group the Europeans but they were golden for who the Muslims the Muslims they had their golden years or golden ages so the Prophet وسلم, triggered this whole inspiration now comes Islam and then after the Prophet وسلم, who do we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Fas'alu ahla dhikr in kuntum la ta'lamun. When you don't know something, you should ask those who are expert. The people. It applies to every branch almost of the society. With regards to religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also includes this. Fas'alu ahla dhikr. Now dhikr. What does dhikr mean? As those, the people of the dhikr. What does dhikr mean? It has several meanings. One meaning of dhikr according to the Quran is the Holy Quran itself. Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sad wal quran the dhikr. Surah Sad, the first ayah. Quran of dhikr. And many other ayat referring to the Holy Quran as dhikr. Okay, that's one meaning. Another meaning of dhikr is the Prophet himself. Allah says in Surah Al-Talaq, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, قَدْ أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكُمْ ذِكْرًا رَسُولًا يَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ Allah has revealed to you or sent down to you a dhikr. Who? Rasulan, a messenger. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ So the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is also dhikr. Why? Because... Both the Quran and the Prophet وسلم, they both illuminate the path, illuminate the heart, can distinguish what is haq and what is batil. And so by following the Quran, following the sunnah of Rasulullah وسلم, a person is guaranteed to be following the truth, the haq. Now, 
before Rasulullah leaves this world, he comes and he says, as a Muslim, Sahih Muslim narrates in his Sahih, he says, the hadith of the Prophet, إِنِّي تَارِكٌ فِيكُمُ الثِّقْلَيْنِ كِتَابُ اللَّهِ وَعِتْرَتِي أَهْلَ بَيْتِي Sahih Muslim narrates this. I am leaving amongst you two things, the book of Allah and my progeny. وَعِتْرَتِي أَهْلَ بَيْتِي مَا إِن تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا لَن تَضِلُّوا بَعْدِي أَبَدًا As long as you behold on to both of them, بِهِمَا Both. Then, لَن تَضِلُّوا لَن أَدَاتُ نَفِيًا لِلْمُسْتَقْبَلِ معناتها يعني never. You will never go astray. وَقَدْ نَبَّأَنِيَ الْعَلِيمُ الْخَبِيرُ أَنَّهُمَا لَنْ يَفْتَرِقَ حَتَّى يَرِدَ عَلَيَّ الْحَوْضِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed me that they will not separate from one another, the Qur'an and the progeny, until the day of judgment, basically. So, here it is the Prophet clearly saying and indicating to us that Ahlul Bayt are the people of the Qur'an. Because he says, I'm leaving the Qur'an and my progeny, both of them. The second thing, if, if the ayah also, if dhikr refers to Ahlul, uh, of the Prophet, then referring to Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, the people of the Prophet, and who is closer to the Prophet than Amir al muminin alayhi salam, Fatima, Hassan, Hussein alayhi salam, and Ahlul Bayt. Allah so. And hence, the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, sorry, Al-Razi, the tafsir of Al-Qurtubi, the tafsir of Al-Tha'labi, the tafsir of Al-Usi, all non-Shia, they all say that فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ are the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then Fatima, Hassan, Hussein, Amir al Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's what they say. These are Ahlul Dhikr. In other words, if you have questions when it comes to religion and non-religious matters, in fact, inshallah, we'll give an example. That when it comes to religion and non-religious, if you have questions, go to the experts. And the experts are Ahlul Bayt, alayhim wassalam. Why? When it comes especially to religion. Why? Let us take a few examples. Some relating to our aqaid, usul al-deen, and some relating to furu' al-deen. So first of all, let's go by Usul al-Din. Al-Bukhari narrates in his Sahih regarding the ayah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ He says, he narrates this hadith. He says, a Jewish man came to the Prophet and he told him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has five fingers. On one finger, he's got the skies. On the other finger, he's got the earth. On one finger, he's got the water. On another finger, he's got the sands. And on the fifth finger, he's got all of his creation. And he says the Prophet laughed in agreement. Read the hadith. He laughed in agreement. And then he recited this ayah, وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ You know, they did not acknowledge Allah the way he should be acknowledged. Now here, if we say that Allah has fingers, then Allah has become a physical being. If Allah is physical being, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be everywhere at the same time. He's physical. Read about physics and the laws of physics. Anything that's physical is confined to a volume and space. How could Allah then be everywhere at the same time? Then, that's one. Two, this negates the Quran. If we accept this hadith, when the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Laysa kamithlihi shay, there is nothing like him. This means this goes against this ayah, because now there is something like him, Allah's fingers. So, right off the bat, we realize there's something wrong here. Now, this is with aqaid, huh? this is usul al-deen. Because tawheed is what? Part of usul al-deen. So we need to understand. Years ago, I was in Medina. And it was the day of Jumu'ah. So this person was giving khutbah to Jumu'ah. And he was saying about the day of Arafat, how great the day of Arafat is. He says, the day of Arafat is so great 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets up from his throne and then descends down from the heavenly skies onto the worldly skies. Now he didn't mention how does Allah descend down. I don't know if he takes an elevator, escalator, stairs, I don't know. But anyways, Allah descends down and then he comes and he greets all the people standing in the Sahra of Arafat. The Sahra of Arafat, the desert of Arafat. He says, welcome my servants, I have forgiven you all. And then after that, after he finished with all this, he said, people, do not visit the graves because visiting the grave is shirk. Don't visit the graves because when you visit the graves, you associate somewhere with Allah. I said, subhanallah, ya akhi. So when you claim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sitting on a throne and he stands up from his throne, now you've already made Allah into a physical being. And then you claim that Allah is stepping down somehow, he's descending down from the heavenly skies into the worldly skies. All this is physical. You've made Allah into a physical being. So all this is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Visiting the graves becomes shirk now, all of a sudden. And then I asked this man, you know, I, I was wondering, you know. The Prophet visited the shuhada of Uhud. He visited the shuhada of Uhud. The Prophet visited his uncle Hamza. So... What, are you saying the Prophet committed shirk In fact, in your own books, you narrate that the Prophet said, I forbid you from visiting the graves, but now I command you to visit them. So maybe in the past, he forbid them, but now he says, now I command you to visit them. Why? Because they remind you of the Akhirah. This is narrated by Bukhari. So, when it comes to that, then we have an issue. We have a problem. When people start personifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is now with Usul al-Deen. Another part of Usul al-Deen is what? The first thing is Tawheed. The second one is what? In Usul al-Deen. What is it? Nubuwa, Nubuwa. Nubuwa is the second one because after Tawheed, after Allah comes the prophets. So Nubuwa, when it comes to Nubuwa, again, Al-Bukhari narrates. He says, that Aisha, one day, Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha says, I had two dancers at my house dancing. The Prophet came and then he just turned his face and slept. Then the first Khalifa, Abu Bakr, came and he looked at the dancer and he told Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha, he said, what are you doing? He brought dancers here before Rasulullah. Rasulullah said, it's okay, just leave them. Then she says, after he slept, I kind of signaled to them to leave. Now, so the Prophet, peace be upon him, the man who Allah says, yuha. He does not speak of desire, it is but a revelation. The Prophet who would never accept any rijs, Muhammad. The Prophet, peace be upon him, accept dancers dancing in his house with instruments, apparently, because when the first Khalifa came, he said, you brought dancers with instruments. And then the, the first Khalifa is more concerned about Islam and the religion of Islam than our Prophet, sallallahu alayhi So you realize here there is something wrong here, something that doesn't add up. This is now saying that the Prophet takes it lightly, takes it easy with regards to Nubuwa, when God when he sees something that's wrong. Another hadith that's narrated is that the Prophet one day told certain farmers who farm dates, date farmers. He told them, you should take the dates before it's too late. So they took the dates, but they were not ripened yet. They were not ripened yet. So they came to Rasulullah and they said, Ya Rasulullah, why did you take us to take the dates when it's not ready yet, it's a bit too early. He said, well, I'm a human being. I'm a human being. I can make mistakes. This, of course, now is an attack on Nubuwa. Again, this is contradictory to the Quran. The Quran says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ He does not speak of desire. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He gets a revelation from Allah. Everything the Prophet does 
says is a revelation. Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, laqad kana lakum fi Rasulillah uswatun hasana. He is a role model. In other way, the way he speaks is a role model. The way he sits is a role model. Plus, again we go back to the ayah of Tathir. Rich, anything, even if it's forgetting, even if it's unknowing, that our Prophet Sallallahu is far greater than that. So that is the problem we have when it comes to Usul al-Din. Usul al-Din. Whereas Amir al-Mu'mineen, Salamullahi alayh, Look how beautifully he makes people realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be described. He cannot be perceived. You know how he did it? He says, look, this is in Nahj al -Balagha. He says, look at a pregnant woman. If Malakul Maut comes to take the life of the fetus inside the womb of his mother, how does he do it? Does Malakul Maut enter into her? womb and he takes his heart, uh, soul and comes out or does he stand outside the body of the pregnant woman and he signals to the soul and the soul comes out or does he live with the fetus he stays there with the fetus until time comes Allah gives him the signal that or the time that you know now you can take the soul away and then he takes it and leaves so he gave three scenarios he says if we cannot perceive how Malakul Maut, who is a creation of Allah, works. How can we perceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allahu Akbar. How beautiful. Indeed. Indeed. So, that is Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam They grant us the true aqeedah of Usul al-Deen. The true belief in Allah. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam when he was asked about the hands of Allah because Allah says in the Quran Yadullah fawqa aydihim the hand of Allah is over their hands so he was asked Ya ibn Rasulullah what does Allah mean by hand does Allah have a hand he told the person he said haven't you read the Quran when Allah says Laysa kamithlihi shay there is nothing like him he said yes I have he says so how can you claim that Allah has a hand this would be contradictory then well ayadu billah he says so what does Allah mean he says a hand is a symbol of power. Allah says His power prevails over their power. Doesn't Allah say in the Quran, Yamkuruna wa Yamkurullah, Wallahu Khayrul Makirin? Innahum yakiduna kaydan wa akidu kayda. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans and they plan. They plan and Allah plans. Allah says Allah's plan will prevail. They plot and Allah plots and Allah's plot will prevail. وَكَذَلِكَ كِدْنَا لِيُوسُفْ That's how we made Yusuf become the king. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala planned. Who else made the king see a dream? And because of that dream, Yusuf became the king of Egypt. One dream. Subhanallah. How the events played. So Allah says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, His power prevails. That's how Imam al-Sadiq explains it to us. And Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he also explains it to us. That's why we need Ahl al-Dhikr because otherwise our Usul al-Deen can be shaken. Wal-Iyadu Billah. Allah could be shaken. That's when it comes to Usul al-Deen. And then there is a long hadith with regards to the Prophets between Imam al-Ruba salamullahi alayh and one of the judges of Ma'mun al-Abbasi where the man was asking Imam al-Ruba about the infallibility of the Prophets. And Imam Rida alayhi salam clearly defended each and every one of the prophets sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi majma'in alayhi wa salam majma'in. All of them proving that they are all infallible. All prophets. And hence this strengthens the aqeedah and prophethood. Nubuwah. Now what about usul al uh, furu' al-deen? Furu' al-deen. Imam Abu Hanif and Nu'man one day came to Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam alayhi. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam asked him, first he introduced himself. He said, I am Abu Hanifa. He said, are you the one who's giving fatwas in Iraq? He said, yes. Mufti al-Iraq? He 
He said, on what basis do you give fatwa? He says, on the basis of the Quran. He says, so give me the meaning of the ayah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa man dakhalahu kana amina. Whomever enters it, he is in safe haven. He's in safety. What is it? He says, that's referring to what? Masjid al-Haram. He says, Masjid al-Haram. He says, if that were true, then why is it that Abdullah ibn Zubair and Sa'id ibn Jubair, they both entered Masjid al-Haram and they were killed inside the Masjid? He says, I'm not sure. He told him, I heard that you give laws by Qiyas. If you don't know an answer, you take a fatwa that is similar and you say, well, since this is similar to this, this is what I have Allah should apply, Qiyas. For example, just to bring the story closer, if you go to a shop and you say, I want to buy this pen, okay? You take it to the shopkeeper. The shopkeeper looks at it, there's no price tag. So what does the shopkeeper do? He says, okay, let me see if there's another pen like this one. And then I'll see if there's a price. He goes, he finds a pen just similar to this one. He says, you know, this one looks similar to this. This one is selling, for example, for $2. Do you accept $2 for this? You say, yes, that makes sense. And what this shopkeeper has done now is Qiyas. He's used a reference. He didn't know what this was, so he used a reference. In religion, we cannot do that. The Prophet says, وَمَا عَلَىٰ دِينِي مَنْ اسْتَعْمَلَ الْقِيَاسَ فِي دِينِي In religion, if I don't know the law of one mas'ala, of one hukum or one ruling, I cannot say, well, that law looks similar to this law, and hence, I can apply the same ruling here. No. Imam Abu Hanifa, though, approves of this methodology. And why? Because it's interesting, you know. If the person who actually ordered this pen, if the order, the one who makes all the orders and the purchasing, if he comes, he knows how much the pen is. Right? He doesn't need to go and see one analogous. But the one who doesn't know, he doesn't do the ordering. He's unaware. That's the one who goes and he does an analogy. Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam are the ones whom the Quran was revealed upon them. So they don't need to draw analogies. They know all the rules. But people who study, they don't know all the answers. And hence, if they don't refer to Ahlul Bayt, that's what they have to do. So, the, the Imam Sadiq salam asked him then, he said, Ya Aba Hanifa, if that is true, then tell me, which is more greater in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Killing someone? or committing adultery wal-iyadu billah. He says, well, obviously killing someone is more greater in the eyes of Allah. He says, then why is it the case that when killing someone, according to Islam, if someone kills, God forbid, you need two witnesses. Two just witnesses have to come and they testify that so-and-so killed. We saw him. But for zina wal-iyadu billah, adultery, how many witnesses do you need? Four witnesses. He says, so now which is greater? He said, I have a question for you. Which is greater or more important, Salat or Siyam? He said, Salat. Because we have a hadith, Salat Amud al Deen. Salat is the pillar of, of religion. It is the first thing that gets looked at on the day of judgment in your books of deed. If it's accepted, then they will look at the remaining of the deeds. If it's rejected, then they close the book and they say, Jahannam is this way, Fadl. So, he says, Salat is more important. He says, if that is the case, then why is it that a woman who has her monthly cycle, she does not to repeat any Salat, she does not need to repeat all the Salat she misses, but she needs to repeat all the fast that she misses. He says, so now which is greater? He says, you cannot say Salat is greater than Siyam or Siyam is greater than Salat. You can't. You cannot say that killing is more greater than Billah, adultery or adultery is greater than killing. You cannot do that. There's no Qiyas. Don't you know that the first individual to perform Qiyas was Iblis Laanatullahi Alayh when he says, you created Adam from clay and you created me from fire. He looked at 
the materialistic aspects. Fire destroys clay. So Iblis looked at the clay of Adam. And he said, I'm greater than him. I'm better than him. Why should I prostrate down to him? When in fact Imam al-Sadiq says, Iblis did not realize the nur of Adam alayhi salam. The nur. His light. Which is not something that was materialistic. When he, if he had realized this, he said, it would have far exceeded his light. He had no light. It's the light of the fire from which he was created. And so on and so forth. That's when it comes to, brothers and sisters, furu' ad And something very simple. Today, the salat. Now the Prophet prayed for so many years in front of the Muslims. And yet, there is still a disagreement as to how the Prophet prayed. Today, if you go... Among the four school of thoughts, the main four school, four school of thoughts are non Shia. Three of them say that when you pray, you have to cross your arms. Three of them. And they have a disagreement as to how you cross. Do you cross like this? Do you cross like this? Above the belly button, below the belly button, that's all discussed. One of them, Maliki, Imam Malik, he says, no, you have to stand straight. So now it's either you cross or you stand straight. This is furu' al deen Whereas Imam al-Ja'far al-Sadiq salamullahi alayh and our Imams clearly tell us that no, you pray the way Rasulullah prayed with his hands down, with his arms down. This is when it comes to furu' al deen Now brothers and sisters, it is extremely important to learn this. Why? Because this is our aqidah. That's our faith. If we can realize why Allah blessed us with Ahlul Bayt, then we have to follow Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam In this day and age, of course, Ahlul Bayt have given us the fuqaha, the maraja, and hence people have to follow a marja. If a marja is muttaqi, adil, adala, one of the conditions of the marja has, he has to be adil. What does adil mean? It means he's a muttaqi, he's pious, he's war'a. He does not indulge into sins, wal billah. These are one of the conditions of the adala of the marja. People have to follow a marja. Why? Just like when people don't understand the medicine, they refer to a doctor. In fiqh, there are all those who are doctors of fiqh. And those are the maraja. Those who are experts in fiqh. Those who can derive laws from the Quran and the sunnah of Rasulullah. And Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. And why is it important to follow the sunnah of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam? Because then you're following the straight path, Surat al-Mustaqeem. One day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sat down next to Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari. He drew one line, big line in the center, in the sand. Jabir says, the Prophet drew one big line in the center. Then he drew two lines on the right, two lines on the left. He said, Ya Jabir, do you see all these lines? He said, yes. He said, the one in the center, that's the longest one. This is Sarat al Mustaqeem. He says, This is the path. He says, Follow the Sarat al Mustaqeem. He says, And don't follow these paths because they will misguide you from the Sarat al Mustaqeem. Again, one day, Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam, he is talking with somebody who does not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Shakid Disani. You see why it's important to follow Ahlul Bayt. Imam al Baqir, his son, was playing with an egg. Imam al Sadiq said, Bring me this egg, my son. So Imam al Baqir brought him the egg. Imam al Sadiq took this egg and he took a look at Abu Shakid Disani. He said, Ya Disani, you see this egg? He said, Yes. He says, It's got a hard shell on the outside. And it's got a soft shell on the inside. And inside that, there is the golden eye, referring to the, what? The yolk. Around it is the clear fluid, referring to the what? The egg white. He says, nor does the yolk mix with that fluid, nor does the fluid mix with the yolk. He says, and again, no one can go in or nothing can come out to tell you whether it is good or bad, or whether it is going to be created as a male or a female. He says, so you think all this does not have someone who's looking after it and making it? 
Hushak al-Disani looked at the Imam, he says, Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah wa anna ka bilhaqqi hujjatullah. I testify that there is no God but Allah. Muhammad is the Prophet of Allah and you are the true messenger or the true successor of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at how beautiful Ahlul Bayt used the argument, you know, the, the, the style of Ahlul Bayt. And taking it, you know, hitting the bullseye as they say. Very eloquently, in a manner that people will understand. So my dear brothers and my dear sisters, when we say that we should follow Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, because that's what the Quran says. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done to us. Whenever it comes to the matter of religion, refer to the Quran and refer to the people of the Quran. And those are Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. The Prophet is their master and then the Imams. And even when it comes to matter which are related in our daily lives, because Islam is not just a religion where we just pray on Salat and the Ahkam. If you take a look at the book of laws of the Maraja, there are part one which is called the Ibadat and part two is the Mu'amalat. One is the Ibadah, Salat, Siyam, and so on and so forth, Ahkam of Tahara. And the other part deals with what? The interactions, transactions. Business, how do you do business, the marriage, and so on and so forth. These are daily transactions. Ahlul Bayt have given us instructions on how to deal in terms of a quarrel. God forbid. If there's a problem between two businessmen, how do you solve it? In fact, how to approach business in ways that you avoid quarrels and all the, from the beginning. Ahlul Bayt have given us advice on how to do counseling. I spoke with a friend of mine, a lecturer the other day. He says, I do a lot of counseling. And he says, every now and then, I also talk to a counselor, a professional counselor. You know, I asked a professional counselor that, you know what? These are some of the issues that arise. How would you deal with them? And the counselor would give, would give me some points. He says, these same points, I find them in the books of Hadith. When we refer to Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, the same points. Subhanallah. Now they just give them a new theories, a new name. This law and that law and this theory and that theory and this whatever. But Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Baqar alayhi salam have given them long time ago. In fact, Dr. Tijani Samawi, you know Dr. Samawi, the one who authored Then I Was Guided. He says in his second book, which is Fas'alu Ahl al-Dhikr, it is titled Fas'alu Ahl al-Dhikr, Ask the People of the Dhikr. He says, people unfortunately have neglected Nahjul Balagha. He says, we've neglected Nahjul Balagha. He says, Nahjul Balagha contains philosophy, economy. He says, contains laws that people should learn today and future as well. People have forgotten about it. That's what Ahlul Bayt have given us, alayhim salam So my dear brothers and my dear sisters, let us turn to Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam because indeed, in them is the Sarat al Mustaqim. Following their path is the straight path. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who follow the path of Ahlul Bayt, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi majma'een. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us their ziyara in dunya, insha'Allah. And we pray to Allah to grant us their shafa'a in the akhirah, insha'Allah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill all the needs of those who are in need. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve all those who are suffering from illnesses. And to grant them quick recoveries, Ya Allah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow his peace and blessings upon all the countries lacking peace and security in the world. Especially the mu'mineen and the mu'minat. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins and to hasten the reappearance of our 12th Imam, Ajallah ta'ala, Farajahu sharif and to make us among his Shia. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the shafa'a of Fatima al-Zahra, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayha. إلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أرواح موات الجالسين والحاضرين رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات على محمد وآل محمد